is here for worship this morning. Uh, if it's your first time, I want to welcome you here. Hope uh, the service has been a blessing and it uh, continues to be. And if you are a regular, what up? Glad you could be here also. So this morning, we start a brand new message series titled Meet Mary, the other one. Um, Pastor Armin is actually away this weekend. He's in Chicago right now speaking at the church of um, uh, Ray Kolbacher, who was a pastor here uh, some 20 years back, and they're celebrating there, and he's there honoring him. Um, and so it's the next two weeks. We're going to do this series. It's a two-part series that will carry us into Easter Sunday, where Pastor Armin will share a, uh, a special story written out of this series uh, that will tie it all, all in together. So that's coming down. And so tonight, this morning, we're going to study Mary Magdalene. And we want to study her because, for me, she, she has had a profound impact. I heard a sermon about her, her life when I was in college, right when I was trying to figure out if I wanted to go to seminary or I was going to travel back to Nigeria and get involved in business, uh, restaurant business. Um, and I heard a sermon about Mary Magdalene, really the last uh, Mary's, when, she, when Jesus Christ resurrected uh, from the dead and Mary Magdalene was by the grave and just her love for Jesus. And, and I remember making the decision based on that sermon, thinking, I'm going to I want to serve the Lord in ministry. I want to be like Jesus, but man, I want to be like Mary. And uh, that'll make sense as we go through this series. Now, to set up this morning's message titled Mistaken Identity, let me tell you a little bit of a personal story from my life. So um, the birth of my first son, Nathaniel, that's my little dude on the screen, um, I, one of the most special events um, in my life, and, and just as a new father, it's huge. And um, so it's, it's huge, but what happened shortly after he was born is really what makes it a very memorable day for me. All right, so he was born, and after he was cleaned up, he was handed over to my wife, and as soon as I, he was handed over, I noticed a birthmark on him. I made nothing of it at the time. I thought it was cute. Well, a few moments later, the nurse comes to take him from her and takes him over to another station where he has to go through some routine checkups, and my wife was very tired, so I went with the nurse, and I ended up on what's known, I guess, as a looking glass, where you're kind of looking at your children or a bunch of other babies there. And my son had apparently aced his test because they brought him out pretty quickly to the looking glass. And so I'm on the other side of the looking glass and a ton of other babies there. Um, and I'm looking at my son and, and I'm admiring him, right? I'm just pouring love on him. I'm taking pictures of him. I'm thinking about the implication of what it means for me. I'm going to be a father, man. Am I ready for this? I was just going to go, right? And as I'm looking at him, Something began to bother me. Couldn't quite put my finger on it at first, but I just, something was off. And, and finally, I noticed his birthmark wasn't where I saw it. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, what's going on? So I went to the other side of the window, and I'm looking, and I still can't see it. Now, by the way, I'd been at the hospital all night, so I'm tired. I'm not thinking straight, right? So I'm tired. I'm looking. I can't see it, and, and it, it bothered me a little bit. And, and then, and, and then, I became even more unsettled because not only was his birthmark not there, but he looked a little skinnier than when they took him from me to the hospital. And uh, he looked a little darker, too. And, and by the way, he was the only African-American baby born that day. Every other baby was Caucasian. And so I'm, I'm, I'm panicking a little bit. I'm like, something's off with my son here. I'm starting to worry what, what, what's up with my son. And so right as panic begins to set in, I did what I probably should have done when I first came there. I looked at the name tag. Check the name tag, and it turns out it wasn't my baby. <laughs> Apparently, there was another beautiful Indian boy with the same skin complexion, the same full head of afro with him there. And so I'm like, that is not my baby. And so I'm starting to look around and make sure this guy's father's not coming at me with a bat. And I'm doing one of these, <laughs> just, just walking away from the, from the child. And his father didn't come at me. Um, a little later, they brought my son. He was fine. He aced all his tests, and they put in some sort of sun tanning contraption, whatever that thing is. And uh, I just stand there, and I loved on my, on, my, on my little son all the love I'd showered on my Indian friend I now poured on my son. <laughs> um, <laughs> and someday my son will grow older, and I'll share that story with him, and we'll have a good laugh. But um, can you imagine, though? Can you imagine, though, if that error had played out fully? 
if that mistake had played out fully? I mean, we're about to go from funny to serious here, right? Um, can you imagine a situation where the nurses and the doctors made the same mistake that I made and we ended up taking the wrong baby home? How tragic, how bothersome would that have been? Yet, a similar situation has been perpetuated in the life of one woman in the scriptures. You might have heard of her. Her name's Mary Magdalene. And history has unfortunately given Mary Magdalene a really bad rap. I mean, it's just tarnished this woman's name. And I know this because when I mention the name Mary Magdalene, most of us, not all of us, and unless you've read the scripture, most of you, when you think of Mary Magdalene, probably think she's one of three people. You probably think she's the sinful woman who was caught in adultery, who almost got stoned, whom Jesus rescued. You probably think that she is the woman who had lived a sinful lifestyle, who later on found Jesus, anointed, uh, washed his feet with her hair after crying on it and anointed it with oil. Or in some extreme cases, you might think Mary Magdalene um, was either a prostitute or perhaps Jesus' secret lover, according to some Hollywood movies and History Channel specials. Poor Mary, huh? What if I told you that Mary Magdalene was neither one of those women described? By the way, how many of you in here actually thought that Mary was one of those three people, have thought in the past, mistakenly, mistakenly, that she was one of those three people? I mean, you guys don't really care. You just find out the first time. Okay. Interestingly, the misunderstanding about Mary did not arise till centuries after she was dead. I mean, in her day, everybody knew exactly who she was and who she was not. And so that's what we're going to do with our time this morning. We're going to talk about who Mary Magdalene is and, and who she's not. And here's why I think we should spend time studying this woman's life. Because, because whenever you read in the scriptures the list of the men who followed Jesus Christ, his disciples, you almost always find Mary's name with them. That and the fact that when we study the lives of men and women who we would describe as saints, you'll find that, um, hey, I have a lot in common with them. I think God gave us those stories in the Bible so we can look at their lives and discover that it isn't by works, but by grace that he makes us his own, that he calls us to do things in his name. So let's talk about Mary Magdalene, specifically with who, who she's not. And, and let's, let's start off with one of the sources of the great confusions with Mary, and it's this. Um, there's just too many Marys. Like in the New Testament, there's, there's too many Marys in the New Testament. One study of recorded names of Jewish women in Palestine between 330 B.C. and 200 A.D. shows that 47, almost 50% of the women there were named either Salome or Mary. How's that for distinguishing yourself? Not only that, in the New Testament alone, there are at least six different Marys you got to wade through. Six different Marys. Let me walk through them real quick so you know who I'm talking about. So there is the all-star Mary, Mama Jesus, right? All-star Mary, we know her. There's no doubt in our mind who she is. Uh, next up is Mary of Bethany, who was the sister of Martha and Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. Then there's um, another Mary in Mark chapter 15, verse 40, who was identified to us as Mary, the mother of James and John, the disciples of Jesus. The other two Marys are mentioned in Paul's writings, the epistles. Uh, one of them is mentioned in Acts chapter 12, 12, who is John Mark's mom. And then there's another Mary described in Romans 16, verse 6, who just faithfully served the church. And so that leaves us with our girl from, from Magdala, Mary Magdalene. In fact, here's, here's the easy way to know who Mary is. Whenever you see her name in Scripture, it's always accompanied with Magdalene. Mary Magdalene means Mary from Magdala. That's the name of her town. And so whenever you're reading scripture, it talks about Mary or the woman. It's not Mary. It always identifies Mary as Mary Magdalene. So that helps us focus a little bit on who it is we're, we're dealing with and we're working with here. So one of the first sources of confusion has been just too many Marys. The other reason why there's been some confusion about who Mary is, you know who's to blame? Greg. When you find him, you should talk to him. He should really stop that. It's all his fault, Greg's fault. And by Greg, I'm really referring to Pope 
Gregory the First, also known as Gregory the Saint, who in 591 AD, and you can find this on any website about him and his sermon on Mary, um, who preached a sermon on Easter Sunday in 591 AD, where for whatever reason, he decided to take three different women and lump them together as one woman. So in that sermon, he takes the sinful woman in Luke 7 who had committed adultery. He takes Mary, uh, I'm sorry, he takes the prostitute woman. He takes Mary of Bethany who anointed Jesus' feet. And then he takes Mary Magdalene. For whatever reason, he decides they're going to be one person. And from that sermon, myth became legend. And Mary has ever been tagged as a prostitute become pop culture, popular culture. So, so too many Marys, Greg, um, and then Hollywood. Hollywood has contributed to this much misunderstanding of who Mary is. Two of what I consider to be the best Hollywood movies about the life of Jesus happen to cast the same woman in the role of Mary Magdalene, but also cast that same woman in the role of a prostitute, of a sinful woman. So let's go through them real quick. In 1977, Frank Zeffirelli's classic movie, Jesus of Nazareth. How many of you guys have seen this one? It's like a seven-hour movie, right? I watched this every Christmas growing up. It was the best movie ever, seven hours. Um, but in that movie, Anne Bancroft plays Mary Magdalene. I mean, she, she just captures Mary Magdalene powerfully. Unfortunately, Anne Bancroft also plays a prostitute early on in that movie. 2004, Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ. How many of you guys saw this movie? Powerful movie, right? Monica Bellucci plays Mary Magdalene. I mean, she brings Mary to life, right, in her passionate portrayal of him. But unfortunately, she's also the sinful woman who committed adultery early on in the movie. She's also cast in that same role. Then, of course, there's the Hollywood blockbuster, The Da Vinci Code, right? In that movie, it was suggested that Jesus and Mary had a secret fling, and they had an offspring who had to go into hiding, of which they have now created a secret society to protect the identity of the bloodline of that offspring. You take three of those together, along with a very popular gospel song that came out in recent decade, in the last decade, titled uh, Mary's Alabaster Box. You take all of those together, and man, you can see how poor Mary has been given a label that was never hers to begin with. So all of that is who Mary is not. Any one of you in here can identify with that? You've been carrying a label with you, either because of something dumb you did years ago that really they should have let go by now, or for something you never had anything to do with, but you've been tagged that, all right, if you've been near Mary, he's like, I feel you. That's who she's not. Let's talk about who she is. And to do that, we're going to look at the gospel. Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. Really, the first three verses in Luke 8 will be on the screen. And, and here, we'll get to meet, like, each one of the gospel mentions Mary Magdalene's, Magdalene's name, and they all have different accounts, but they all tell the same story. And so we're picking Luke because he has just, he details a little bit more about her. Let me read it to you. It says, after this, that's after what Jesus was doing, he says, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 disciples were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Here it is. Mary called what? The name always follows her. That's the way you know who you're talking about. Mary called back Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. We're going to come back to that, so don't forget that, okay? Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. And these women were helping to support the ministry of Jesus out of their own means. So please note this. When we're introduced to Mary Magdalene in the scriptures, there is no mention of her having prostituted herself to make a living. Nor is there any mention of her having living a lifestyle or a sinful lifestyle. What we know of her first meeting, two things we know of her first meeting, oh, when we first meet her in the scriptures. Number one is this, she was a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. That's all we're told. She was a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And number two, um, she contributed financially to support the ministry of Jesus. It's very likely that she joined Jesus' entourage during one of Jesus' missionary journeys through her town in Magdala. 
We can also surmise, based on accounts, other accounts, that she was not married because her husband's never mentioned. Perhaps she was widowed, or maybe, once again, she never even married. It's also safe to presume that she was a hard worker who made a living, made a decent, moderate income, because out of that income, Scripture tells us, she and other women were able to support the ministry of Jesus financially. And that includes, by the way, just Jesus, 12 grown men, and a bunch of other people. So she was moderately well-to-do. Liz Curtis Higgs wrote a phenomenal book that goes into a lot more detail that I don't get into, but the book is titled Unveiling Mary, and it's part fiction, part biblical study. Um, but in her book, she writes this concerning Mary's assumed role, and here's what she says. She says in her book, she says, since Mary is always listed first when Mary, the mother of Jesus, and others are mentioned, it is clear that Mary Magdalene was a leader among these women. So in the scriptures, whenever the list of um, scripture, whenever it has a list of names, it always lists names in order of importance or priority. So whoever's name's at the top probably means they're in charge, right? So Mary's name often, almost always comes before the list of other women when her name is mentioned in a group. Concerning her age, Higgs writes this. She says, if Jesus Christ was 30 years old when he met Mary Magdalene, could have been older, then his mother was a minimum of 44, assuming that Jesus was conceived when she was 13. So in order for Mary Magdalene to lead a group that included this esteemed woman, that's Mary, the mother of Jesus, then it means that Mary Magdalene would no doubt have been the same age or older than the mother, than Mother Mary in her mid-40s at least, possibly a good bit older. Mary was, uh, Magdalene certainly was past the childbearing years, perhaps a widow, giving her freedom to leave her town Magdala behind and follow Jesus. As to her appearance, Liz writes this. She says, I gently place her in the category of a woman who had a beautiful soul rather than a picture-perfect face and curvaceous figures because outward appearance never impressed God. Which, which by the way, is so revealing because whenever pop culture talks about Mary Magdalene, they tend to centralize her, all right? And we see none of that. There's a picture of dignity and honor in a woman who's been through some, but man is, is walking with the Lord daily. Okay. Now, in everything I just read in those three verses, there's probably a verse that caught your attention. In fact, I, draw, I drew attention to it, right? There's a part that caught your attention about Mary's background that made most of you go, hmm. And it's the little part about Mary having seven demons. Not one, not three, not five, seven demons expelled from her. Like in the scriptures, we read of many accounts where one young boy or one man or, or woman was possessed by one demon, and we, we read that those demons tormented this person and was miserable. Can you fathom what life must have been like before Jesus for Mary Magdalene to have seven demons take up residence in her? Next week, in part two of this series, I'm going to share a personal story, a surreal experience that I had here on staff during the week, um, not this week, a while back, a surreal experience where I had a pastoral visit where I came face-to-face -face with a demon-possessed woman and what that encounter. I'll share that next week, and we'll get into that. But So let, let me just say this from that experience and from what I've studied. Uh, demons have one mission. And it's, it's to seek and destroy. Really, it's to seek, separate from God, and destroy. To seek out, so they're not lying by idly. To separate from God, so there's no sense of hope. And ultimately, to destroy, and, and destroy, really not only physical death, but ultimately to keep to a point where you never respond to the gospel. And we see that, man, in, in Mary's life. I mean, demons don't just want her dead. They don't just want you dead. They want to hurt. They want to harm. They want to torture. But more than all of those is that demons want to separate you, rob you of any hope that you might have in Jesus Christ. It's their main mission. And this was the case with Mary Magdalene. We're not giving any details about her life during those demon possession years, but this much we can surmise based on the rest of her story, and this much we can surmise, that Mary was deeply grateful and deeply thankful that Jesus expelled seven demons out of her. Like people who have been 
rescued, freed from addiction are very grateful. People who've been saved and rescued from seven demons tend not to be only appreciative and grateful, but man, they tend to cling like crazy. They become devoted to the thing, a person who rescued them from the hounds of hell. Did you get that? People who've been rescued from demons tend to be or any hardship for that matter that's had them in a bondage for years, tend to lock on and tend to be devoted to the thing or person who delivered them from their prison. Which explains then why it is we seem to see Mary's name next to Jesus' name so many times in scriptures. Like, have you considered the fact that Mary was one of the only disciples who stayed behind during Jesus' crucifixion when everyone else ran away in hiding? All the men had left, and all the thousands of followers who a week early on Palm Sunday were partying up a storm. Jesus is here, had gone into hiding. Mary, I think maybe with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John the Apostle, were the only ones who stood by Jesus at the cross. You ever wondered why it is that on Easter Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene is one of the only four women who went back to the grave to make sure Jesus was there? You ever wonder why it is that on Easter Sunday morning, after Jesus was no longer in the grave because he'd resurrected back to life, Mary, after everyone else had gone, Mary stays behind. Hurting because her Savior had been taken from her. So much so that when Jesus actually shows up, the resurrected Jesus shows up. Remember Mary, in fact, this was the part of the sermon that for me just... Blew my heart away why I really fell in love with Mary. Jesus shows up, and she's in so much grief and so much pain, and her eyes are so flooded with tears, she doesn't recognize him. Like, she's like, where, where did you put my Savior? And Jesus had to, hey, Mary, Mary. John 20, 17 tells us that when she recognizes Jesus, here's what she does. She grabs hold on to him, as in, I'm never letting you go. Like, no one's going to take you away from me. So much so that Jesus had to tell her, don't cling. In, in other versions, it says, don't hold me, woman, which sounds rude, but he's really saying, I'm, he I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. Don't, don't cling to me. There's work to be done, Mary. I dare to say that, that <laughs> when everyone else had left, Mary loved the Lord, remained behind. Um, I propose that God was rewarding her for a faithfulness Hence, why Mary is the first person in Christian history to see the resurrected Jesus Christ. Like some people, maybe in our day, in our future, will be the last person who trusts in Jesus Christ before Jesus Christ comes back. Mary had the privilege of being the first person who saw the resurrected Christ. I mean, that girl's got a story to tell in eternity. What a gift, what an honor that God would say, would let her see the resurrected Christ. Listen, Mary Magdalene loved Jesus Christ with all her heart and all her mind, all her soul, all her body, not because she had some secret admiration for him as a lover, but because he rescued her soul, because he saved her from the pits of the grave, because he rescued her from seven demons. And because he gave her a family, he called her his own. This woman loved much because she'd been rescued from much. And man, we, we can learn from her. What have you been rescued from? Is your love for the Lord proportionate to what he's delivered you from? There's much that can be said about Mary Magdalene and much will be said next week and in the sermon coming. But for now, let's take Mary's story, this idea of mistaken identity, and let's talk, let's talk about us. Let's, I'm going to talk to you this morning. And, and here's the question I want to start off. It's a weird question, so work with it. Who are you? Beyond your personality, ethnicity, all that, who, who are you? <laughs> Some of you are like, that is a good question. I've been asking myself that same question for 20 years. Who am I? But seriously, though, I, I asked that question because, man, I got to tell you, I'm in ministry. I have met too many Christians who are unintentionally 
living under a false identity. And what I mean by that is this. For whatever reason, many of you have bought into the labels that have been attached to you, labels that people in your life have placed on you, that you've placed on yourself so that many of us now define ourselves by what we did and who we were and, and what was done to us as opposed to who we are. So, so some of you have been through some pain. I acknowledge that. But unfortunately, you've defined yourself through that pain. When you, when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, who do you... Who do you tell yourself you are? Because, man, that is the most honest moment of your day, by the way, because there ain't no pretending there. It's just you in the mirror. Like, there's no makeup. There's no pretense. There's no, your guard's down. Who, who do you, what do you say to yourself about yourself in the morning when you look in the mirror? Because whoever you tell yourself you are will often shape how the rest of your day goes. Some of you look in the mirror and what you hear are the things that you were told every single day of your life growing up, that you filter who you are through who you were. Some of you filter yourself through some wrong decisions you've made and you define yourself by your pain. And your father in heaven is calling the real you to say, that's, that, that, that's not you. So who are you? One author begins to answer this question in his book. He writes this. He says, you are not what's been done to you. Let me say that again. You are not what's been done to you, but what Jesus has done for you. You are not you're what you, you do, but what Jesus has done what you do doesn't determine who you are. Rather, who you are in Christ determines what you, what you do. So, so listen to me. This is huge. The issue of your true identity, that question of who you are, the issue of your true identity has to start and finish at the cross of Jesus Christ. Not with the stuff you own, not with the stuff you've done, not with what you're great at or awful at. It has to start at the cross of Jesus Christ. We spent an entire message series trying to drive this point home in the last series titled Sons and, of, Sons and Daughters of the Almighty. And we just spent a nine series making the point that your first identity, your first identity, listen, before your ethnicity, so whether you're black, white, Latino, Asian, whatever, your first identity before your ethnicity, before your social status, before your economic status, before your personality, your first identity is first and foremost, hear me on this, as a child of God. And until you begin to define yourself by that label, you are living under a false identity. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, I love this, it says, in Love. God predestined, predestined you, and that's huge, and we could do a whole sermon on that, but predestined you to be adopted as sons and daughters of the Almighty through Christ, simply because why? Because it gave him great pleasure. It blows my mind away. God didn't look into your future and see how Christian you would become or how faithful you would be to his word. And he looked at you, and in spite of all your junk and sinfulness, he says, mine. He adopts you fully into his family. That means, I'm going to say it again, that the issue of your value, ladies and men, hear me, the issue of your value has been settled at the cross. You can't do any more to earn God's love to make him love you more. You can't do any less to make him step away from you. You're locked in. Complete love, complete affection. So no matter what lies you've bought into, that your parents have spoken into you, that friends have spoken into you, that the world have told you about, no matter what lies the enemy and your own flesh tells you about who you are, please hear me. You are first and foremost a child of God. You are sealed. How many of you guys might want to turn around and look at your back? You are sealed with the mark of the Holy Spirit who cries out and affirms that 
Abba, Father, he's yours. And by the way, this takes work. There are some times where you are going about your day and those lies begin speaking. You got to go, liar! And you got to declare that, no, I belong to the Lord. I'm forgiven, completely marked by him, gifted by him. I might not know my gifting yet, but I'm of the Lord. And your label as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a child of God, trumps every other label that anyone might have placed on you, even you. And until you begin defining yourself through that label, man, you, you, you might be living under a mistaken identity. You know, Mary Magdalene will never be able to come back and clarify the issue of people mistaking her identity, but she doesn't need to because, why? She's with her savior, whose opinion is the only one that really counts. And she doesn't care what you think. But you can do something about how you live. So listen, tomorrow morning, we're going to end with this because I've already run over time. Tomorrow morning, when you stand in front of the mirror and those lies, because I, I know it's lies because I stand in the mirror and, and in that moment, man, I, sometimes I don't want to look at myself because I think about the stuff in my past. And man, when that happens, in that moment, remind yourself, let the spirit of God within you arise. Allow him room to minister to you that you are a child of God, child of the Almighty, highly favored, greatly loved, not because of anything you've done, but because of all that Jesus Christ did. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much. In fact, I don't invite you guys to stand up. Let me send us out with this prayer. Father, I lift up the hearts and minds of your people, Lord. God, I pray especially for those who've just who've been wearing the wrong labels their whole lives, perhaps due to failures in their past or, or just other wounded people speaking negatively into their lives. And, and Father, the lies that we've bought into, God, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would mute every lie of the enemy in our lives about who we truly are. And Father, you would crank up the volume of the Spirit of God living within your people, that they would hear clearly that they are children of God, sons and daughters of the Almighty, highly favored, greatly loved, not because of anything they've done, but because the Father calls you his own. And so, God, I commit them into your hands as they go from here. May they speak with such boldness and such courage and such confidence as children of the King that the men and women in their lives who are far from God would hear them and long for Jesus in them. God, we go in your name today. And in Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. amen. Have a great week, y'all. We'll continue this next week.